You're listening to a Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, Editor-in-Chief of CraftsmanOnline.com. The reason why there was a little bit of a pause there is I had to double check. I'm like, yeah, I don't think we're going to get into the area of opinions that could be controversial with this one, but hey, you never know. Uh, as we get ready to tackle the topic of the distinctions between speculative and operative Masons with our returning guest, Brother John Nagy. Welcome back, Brother Nagy. Thanks again for having me, Brother Michael. It's an honor and a privilege and a delight. You know, Brother John is our returning guest. He's a member of the Pearl of the West Masonic Lodge Number 146 in Newport Ritchie, Florida, and the Florida Lodge of Research, 32nd Degree Mason, 2014 recipient of the Dwayne Anderson Award for Excellence in Masonic Education. And of course, he's the author of the Building Better Builder series of Uncommon Masonic Education books, which tonight that's going to come in handy as we get to that difference between speculative and operative Masons. Now, in our rituals, Freemasons, these are usually compared to when they talk to the bands of workmen or the use of the working tools of a master mason or any of the degrees in masonry. Before we get too far into this, how do you generalize the difference between operative and speculative? Some would say it's operative work with their hands and speculative work with their minds. I have, depending on the audience, uh, canned definitions depending on the focus of the audience can definitions. And when you ask a generalized question, I'll give you a generalized response. If you're referring to the historical aspect, the division between uh, the Freemasonic organizations starting up in the Grand Lodge era around 1717, speculative Masons are those individuals who uh, joined the craft of Freemasonry in and around the time of the Grand Lodge era from 1717 on, roughly, because we know that there were individuals joining prior to this, but we use this as a dividing line. Prior to that, the operative Masons are best described as stone crafters, individuals who literally use the working tools, using their hands and using their minds to craft monoliths and constructions and all sorts of stone craft objects for their patrons and they were the operative masons that is usually what most speculative masons learn by joining up and learning the lore of our craft there is also a way of looking at this that is beyond the dogma of the craft that we learn by joining Freemasonry. And that has to do with the fact that the operatives are those who apply the theory and the speculatives are the ones that think up the theory. The speculatives are the ones that work with metaphor, allegory, symbols, cultivating their mind and their hearts whereas the operatives are the ones who take what it is that has been crafted within the mind and bring it to fruition as a reality on earth. So if you really truly want to look at the difference between a speculative and an operative Mason, a speculative is the one who understands the symbols, the meaning behind them, and what it is supposed to be doing to craft the internal part of themselves. And that very same person could be an operative Mason if they are taking everything that is symbolic, the metaphor, the allegory, and applying it within the, their life internally and externally to manifest the very things that are talked about speculatively. Mm. The more I talk with you and do research, the more I'm like, ah, it's facing the thing that you didn't 
we're always told that Freemasonry evolved from the Stonecraft guilds and the actual stone masons. But then there's this romantic idea with the unicorns around the campfire club where we sit there and like, hey, but maybe, maybe we came from Egypt. Maybe that's what happened. And the interesting thing is, is when you start to... (laughs) I love how the podcast that people will never see the sigh, but the video viewers will. <laughs> I love his eyes. The, the interesting thing is, is that when you start to go back to operative versus speculative, when you said that line was drawn, you realize that that was also around the time when Napoleon and they found the Rosetta Stone and then Egyptology exploded everywhere. And it's, hey, of course, of course, we're going to want to tie to this this new thing that we've discovered. Let's get away from the quote unquote dark ages and those guilds and let's follow that. And then you realize, no, that that's just a rabbit hole that leads to literally nowhere. Or it could very well be that the playwrights that put together our ritual, created the morality plays, decided that these were topics of interest at the time. And what they did was they spun tales and they spun rituals that captured the imagination and the interest of the folk in and around that time who had interest in them. They spun Egyptian tales in there. They spun tales of the Knights Templar and quite a few other things. And it captured the interest of the individuals who wanted to come through, join the organization and be not only educated, but stirred to research further. And part of the problem is that they did such a wonderful, wonderful job of spinning these tales that many of the members coming through didn't understand that that's exactly what they were. They were allegory. They were not historical spinnings, but allegorical spinnings. And as a result, you have a lot of literature in the 1800s that went off into what I call the unicorn land. Very, very romantic notions of us being able to embrace, cloak ourselves in the lore and role play all to our heart's content in a fantasy world that is of our own making. Mm. What's interesting is that the speculative wanted to become Freemasons because they saw the work the operatives were doing and wanted to glean something from it. And I think that that's a a very important statement because now we're trying to still present Freemasonry to men who would be drawn to it for the speculative reason only. There are no operative Freemasons anymore in our organization. Maybe that's what we need. There are some operatives defined as individuals who are taking the speculations and applying them in their lives Unfortunately, they're rare. Majority might take one or two pieces and apply them in their lives or keep them on their back burner, so to speak, as they're living their lives. But the difference between a Stonecraft operational mason of years past and a modern day operational mason that isn't really working with stone, they're working on their person is that one actually did work with stone. And today, the entirety of ritual is designed for us to craft our own ashlar, literally to take the different working tools and apply them to ourselves so that we can build an edifice that we can be proud of, that we can also use to get a better communication with our understanding of God. And if you take the whole long body of the first three degrees and understand what the goal is, the goal, once again, that I've mentioned it before, the trestle board is to build that spiritual building. Well, you don't build a spiritual building just thinking about it. You've got to think about it, speculate, and then say, okay, now that I've thought about it and I've got my created a plan of action, what must I do to apply all the thoughts and all the things that ritual points me to in order for me to build that spiritual house. So where we lose out as a modern day craft is that we 
don't think operatively on the speculative aspect of our craft. If we talk about a common gavel, well, how do you train an apprentice to direct that common gavel to reduce the amount of vices and superfluities that they have in their lives? Do you see any Grand Lodge program that is designed around creating that possibility for the entered apprentices coming through? Mm -hmm. Your 24-inch gauge, wonderful concept. But have you ever seen a bunch of EAs running around with a day runner working on their time <laughs> management? Because that's part of apprenticeship. Where's and their Franklin Covey notebook? <laughs> exactly. The problem is that we have so many beautiful working tools and we have a lot of people who say, oh, that represents, uh, you know, squaring your actions. Like, you're great. Well, how do you go about doing that in your life? That's where the operative aspect of the craft is missing. We keep on saying, well, we're speculative masons by God. And, you know, and we pride ourselves on being a continuation of the operative. But even in ritual years ago, in some rituals, in some jurisdictions, it was said that the stone crafters were both speculative and operative masons. They weren't just operative. They weren't just what I call stone bangers. They didn't whack away at stone and not think about it. They, they had to think about what they were doing in order for them to craft what they were able to craft. And we should take that cue from certain jurisdictional rituals to remind ourselves that it, we shouldn't just be absorbing this stuff and thinking, patting ourselves on the back, saying, what a good Mason are we? If we don't apply what it is that we are learning, and if we don't apply the principles on a daily basis and work with those tools, and every one of those tools represents a internalized discipline. Time management is a discipline. A divestiture of vices and superfluities is the development of the four cardinal virtues along with the three theological virtues. So when we see that common gavel, it is a reminder that we've got to build virtues into our daily manner and routine. And of course, if you want to square your actions, the only way you can square your actions, if you develop that square of virtue by virtue of using the common gavel to invest those virtues into your daily routine. And of course, you got boundaries and standards that you've got to develop. And that's by using the compasses, which are on the very Bible that you put your hand on to say your obligations, to say you're going to be a better guy, you know? But there you've got three working tools, the square, the compass, and the Holy Bible, the volume of sacred law. Three working tools that we put our hands on. We swear that we're going to be a better guy. And what do we do? We learn ritual and we teach the next crew coming through to learn ritual. But have we really learned it? Because if we're not applying it, what have we done? We've just stored it inside. We've got the roadmap and we're just passing the roadmap down, but we're not following it. We're going to internalize a roadmap. We want to follow it, learn the terrain and become stronger and more vibrant men as a consequence of internalizing all these disciplines. So Professor Nagy is back <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things we can help, you know, men listening and brothers listening is with the history of the craft and how it began with speculative masonry. We we're touching on that. And what I love is that you can, you have a gift for examining the etymology of words and when we hear the word speculative and operative, one, the question can be, are we using them correctly? Or are we using the right words? I'm curious what definitions or details that you have found that would actually connect with Freemasonry between speculative and operative. The interview has gone in a direction that I don't think I have taken a quick crib sheet on the side. So let me wing it here. The biggest thing that I see going on with the use of the word speculative is that most of the individuals I encounter these days from day one within the craft, they're conjecturing. 
they're basically throwing stuff out on the wall, hoping it'll stick. And it's not based on any kind of deep thought whatsoever. It's just something that they came up with. It sounded good. Other people say it sounded good, but there's unicorns. You know, you can find people who like looking at them and they create all these unicorns and they're really proud of what it is they came up with. And they will go so far as to say, and this is something that I've talked with you about either on podcast or on the side. Everybody has their own interpretation. And that is true. Unfortunately, the problem with that statement is that there's only a few of those interpretations that are optimum. The rest really don't apply. And they've got no structure. They've got no backing. They've got absolutely no empirical connections to what it is that is going on. I'll give you a typical example of conjecture. I've seen, unfortunately, some very, very high up there, Masons quote this. There was a conjecture that freestone Masons was what we supposedly were called during the operative phase of our development Mm -hmm. based on the premise that we are a continuation, which I don't believe, but let's go with the conjecture here. So they say, well, since the terms freestone mason was used, they just truncated the stone and called us Freemasons. And I love it. Sounds romantic. I love the rhetoric. It just rolls off my tongue. I want to embrace it until I say, wait a second. Then how do you explain free bakers and free tailors and free blacksmiths and free fishmongers? They were all called free, whatever their trade was. So were they also working with stone, free stone? Mm -hmm. And so it's like free stone tailors and free stone blacksmiths. And until you start looking at not just the confirmation bias that you're trying to embrace, but when you look at the bigger picture, you recognize, yes, it sounds great until you start putting it within the context of all the guilds at the time. And you recognize all the guilds had either Frank Franch or free in front of their profession. So therefore this free stone Mason just doesn't hold any water. And then we say, well, they were free to travel here and there and, and everywhere. And then you start recognizing that, no, they were pretty well bound to the guild and they, they weren't free to travel. They were pretty locked in there. Speculative Masons, they weren't the demise of, operative masons there's operative masons to this day correct in fact you can apprentice and when you apprentice you learn all the theories and you go through school and you learn not only the mental aspect of the craft which backs up what some jurisdictions say they were not just working with their hands they were working with their minds and they also are given daily opportunity to work with their hands on the very things that they will eventually be asked to work as masters on. And I got to find a a Freemason who is a Mason and (laughs) because I'm very curious, I'm sure you've been doing this much longer than I have. When you come across, you know, new friends or introductions, they find out you're a Freemason. Oh, bricklayer. No, no, no. I, I don't do anything construct Freemason. Oh, and then, then there's always that chain. So I always wonder, yeah, I'm a Mason. Oh, uh, from like you know, the American Revolution. No, no, no. Actually, I work with bricks. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I, I just wonder what their questions are like. There's fewer of them. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, the interesting thing is that when you talk with these individuals, they don't call themselves Freemasons. They call themselves Masons. Right. And Freemasons and Masons are entirely two different things. However, prior to the Grand Lodge era, if you had the word free before Mason or free dash Mason, not free compound word Mason, you were considered a master. You were considered a master craftsman. The Mm. word free literally meant superior, excellent, or pure, or master. 
And when you hear the term free and accepted, the word accepted literally meant those that were brought into the craft that were apprentices and free was the master. So free and accepted literally translates to master and apprentice masons. And that particular term got coined around the 1700s and Freemason, the compound word was first appearing around that time. In fact, you will see a lot of individuals who have taken liberty with history and they will take free space Mason or free hyphen Mason. And they'll say, see, there were Freemasons. Mm. Well, yes, they were Freemasons, but not Freemasons as we know them within our organization. And I, had an individual put a beautiful, beautiful history presentation of Freemasons and the Knights Templar up on Facebook, talking about all the beautiful temples and cathedrals that were built. And they used the word Freemason, compound word Freemason. And I said, no, they were Masons. They were not Freemasons. They might be free space or free hyphen Masons, but they were not Freemasons because Freemasonry only came into being around 1717. Now, now, you have a bunch of individuals who supposedly joined operative lodges that were speculative Masons, according to the interpretation. And I say interpretation because I believe it's conjecture. And let me tell you why. You had groups of men who came together in these taverns and alehouses and what have you. And anytime you had a group of men come together, they were called a lodge. It didn't make a difference whether they were masons or tailors or blacksmiths, made no difference. They had a project to build, they came together, and they only came together when there was a project and money, otherwise they would dissolve. And they met in meeting rooms, and the meeting rooms was where these lodges met, as in groups of men. So if you had a group of masons get together, they would always have not only their workforce, but all the associated individuals in the project. So you might have a leather crafter, you might have a blacksmith, you might even have somebody who provided food, a baker of some sort, come to these meetings and talk about projects where they needed the resources to be coordinated. And you also had individuals who joined in on the fun because they enjoyed the camaraderie and they enjoyed what was going on. And they were also patrons paying money to these lodges for whatever project they have. It is wrong for us to assume that they were speculative masons. They might have joined the lodge. They might have been considered an apprentice mason honorary. but they had absolutely no interest in the craft whatsoever. And just because they had no interest in the craft itself or learning the trade doesn't make them speculative masons. It just makes them members of that particular lodge. And right. they, there is the conjecture. There is the leap, the assumption that many authors make. They say just because they joined and they weren't interested in the craft, that makes them speculative. No, that just makes them members. That's right. all it makes them. And most of the time paying members because, again, the lodges had to have some sort of resources coming in to support their habit of getting together, whining and dining and what have you. <laughs> Today in the podcast world, we call them subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other theory that's, that's out there is the transition theory. And I, I know you're familiar with this, but for those that are like, what transition, what are they talking? This is the idea that wealthy men or those that were born into nobility were accepted into Masonic lodges after paying dues. So these would not necessarily be the guys that you would see hanging out with the other workmen at the bar or the tavern. These were men who were like, I'm drawn to this for these larger purposes, these, these other reasons. And I've always enjoyed that. And it's one of those things where I'm, I'm hoping that in the unicorns or on the campfire club, that at least that storyline, some of that can be true. Now, keep in mind around 1717, you had four lodges come together and they decided to have an annual feast and they were planning it for at least a year beforehand. So when you talk about 1717, supposedly around 1760, they met a year before and say, hey, let's plan this where we're going to have a, our first official meeting and then have quarterly meetings between the lodges. And 
if you read the actual notes and read what actually happened, you'll recognize that these were excuses for them to get together and wine and dine, tell stories, and not really talk about business just to get together as four lodges. And they called it a Grand Lodge. We're talking about four lodges. And we're not talking about a lot of men in one big room. We're talking about a few men meeting in a very small room, getting together for the purposes of quarterly dinner parties. And what happened was the word got out what was going on. And there were individuals who automatically said, I'd like to do that too. So it must have been a beautiful insight on the part of the individuals who had organized this originally saying, hey, we've got something pretty good going on here. Let's put something together and make it worth their while joining. So they researched rituals and they said, hey, we can put something together. And it was very rudimentary, a bunch of Q&A back and forth. And I promise this, that, and the other. The problem is that the lodges started getting out of hand because let's face it, if you get enough members joining, you can't have them meet in one room. You've got to split the group up. Mm. So the premier grand lodge, from what I understand, they were the only ones who could make fellow crafts. Well, I'm saying to myself, well, it's a big leap from them only being able to make fellow crafts to individuals who basically were fellow crafts all their lives. What was going on here? Well, they mm. were making speculative fellow crafts. Why? Because it was only a fellow craft that could run a lodge. So you had a bunch of apprentices and you had a fellow craft that was made by the Premier Grand Lodge to essentially run the lodge. And of course, they went through what is called the master's part to say, here's what we promised to do. And it was a ceremony. It wasn't really ritual. We call it ritual, but it really was just a ceremony installing the officer into the position of being a fellow craft, taking over so that he can run a lodge and basically do the ritual to bring further apprentices. And at that time, apprentices were basically full-fledged members. They had all voting rights and all the rights, rights, and benefits. Well, got out of hand. And eventually they took the apprentice degree, broke it into two, creating the now apprentice and fellow craft degree. And the master's part went by the wayside until, of course, around 1725, when a theatrical group put together the Iron Biff legend. The Grand Lodge heard about it, said, don't do that. And then the Grand Lodge started doing that. Of course they did. <laughs> it was only a very few handful of men who could afford going through the master Mason degree that was that drama. But the fellow craft was the highest degree because basically, or shall I say, the master Mason who ran the the worshipful master then what happened was when the premier grand lodge broke the apprentice degree into two forming the now ea and fellow craft now the degree the fellow craft degree could be put on by the lodges and the lodges were making their own fellow crafts to therefore allow them to have new worshipful masters and then of course it grew into finally that in order for you to be a full-fledged member you had to become a master mason but that was until years later Right. And it's interesting when you talk about this, because I feel like we're going the other way now, <laughs> honestly, in, in this modern time is that it could soon come back to the day where there's just a handful of us meeting in a room. And that's what constitutes a lodge, because that's really what a lodge has always been. It's just the buildings are great, but that's really what a lodge meeting is. As speculative Masons, what can we do to ensure that our practice of the craft continues for future generations. Well, if you're trying to preserve the ritual because of the beauty of the ritual and what, what you effectively have done is said, okay, we're a theatrical society. We're going to put on theater. We're going to call it ritual. And we're going to train the next group of individuals to repeat the same for the next group of individuals. So it becomes basically a, theatrical society bestowing degrees on men so that they can bring new people in through these rituals, these play, morality plays. You can continue doing that. 
And that's what they've been doing for 300 years, roughly. Right. If you want to make it something that is going to be attracting men toward betterment, then you've got to start implementing the operative side of applying what ritual points us to. And it's not, it's not enough to just memorize and repeat and put these morality plays on. You've got to now roll up your sleeves and start basically using these speculative tools and applying them on your person so that you can eventually strengthen yourself and inform yourself and then use that strength and use that information to research the great books of nature and revelation so that you can start designing your spiritual building and becoming that spiritual building through the work that you do operatively using the speculative roadmap. Mm. So I would just had a thought, you know, our operative brothers would do plays, morality plays that were tied to the feasts that were to the saints of the craft and the guilds at that time, basically doing public demonstrations. And this is one of the things I love about a podcast is that I'll get emails for saying this out loud, but we do say in the beginning, these are our own thoughts, not of any Grand Lodge or anybody else. Do you think it would be appropriate someday to consider doing a public? I know a lot of people see our Masonic funerals and that's a public ceremony, but is it, is that something that we could consider a feast with a a ceremony again? Michael, my brother, I think one of the greatest things that we have allowed to slip through our fingers is we have millions of actors And we have no plays to share with the general public to educate them as we did, supposedly, if this is a continuation of Stonecraft, as we did early on pre-1717. We've literally taken our plays, made them peculiar as in private, privately owned, and we put them behind the walls. If we were able to develop some wonderful educational and entertaining plays, morality plays that could be put on for the general public and open our doors on special nights as an open house and go through these plays and use the plays again with our own acting ability to educate the public and actually present it to potential candidates what it is that they're missing out on we would have great opportunity to market and do it in a very friendly, a very proactive and absolutely splendidly educational way. But we miss the opportunity because Mm -hmm. we don't acknowledge what we do to our own selves. And if we embrace what we do, which is again, a society, a theatrical society with a moral purpose, If we keep that in our minds, then if we're a theatrical society with a moral purpose and we're educating our people who come through our members and giving them three roadmaps at the Blue Lodge level, what is preventing us from taking that, expanding it out, developing some really hardcore entertaining or delightfully entertaining presentations where all the members of the entire lodge have some line of contribution and having people come in and view these public displays of what it is we have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. I, missing, I think that missing the boat. Yeah. I, I, I think that we are missing a tremendous opportunity there with all the talents, you know, brothers that are musicians, just everything that uh, could, could be brought into an open, you know, house for a lodge meeting. And I, I think going, you know, kind of wrapping up this conversation where, where we began is that, for many men, the first time they hear, hey, operative, speculative is in that entered apprentice degree. And that's really where it ends right there. And maybe it's something that we need to look at as master masons is we need to go back to the origins of being a speculative masons, not because it's what we're told what we are, but it's because it is what we are. And going one step further, and as our supposedly ancient brethren did they were both speculative and operative 
and we need to don the cape and don the masks and don the roles of what they did early on and take the working tools and use them operatively on our persons and craft ourselves into the better men that we were supposedly saying we joined for making good men better. Yeah, I agree. We need to take the little symbols off the back of our cars <laughs> and start projecting them in our everyday lives. I totally Amen. agree. This has been the Craftsman Online Podcast. I want to thank again my guest this week, the returning brother, John Nagy. Thank you, John. You're most welcome. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share further light with my brothers. You're a gem, Brother Michael. Thank you so much for making all these things happen for our brothers and bringing these wonderful podcasts for them to learn and ponder on. He says it like he's never going to get invited back. (laughs) But Brother Nagy will be back in two weeks and we'll be mapping out the degree work in masonry. Until then, a reminder that new episodes of our podcast are available for download every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail.